Thank you very much. Please remain standing as we administer the oath. I, Blambo Nelson, do solemnly swear that my testimony that I have come to give to the TRC of Liberia is the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Please be seated. Good morning, our witness. Good morning, Commissioner. We want to thank you very much for coming and extend to you our appreciation that you could take off time, a valuable time to come and share your experience with the Commission. We also apologize for the late start, which kept you waiting almost an hour because of some circumstances beyond our control. Your presence, as well as that of others, is viewed by the Commission as part of your patriotic contribution to our lasting search for genuine peace and reconciliation. This process has evolved to this point out of the Accra Peace Agreement, and Liberians, after a prolonged period of conflict, are today searching within themselves to find out where did we go wrong, what can be done, what were the root causes of the conflict, how can we avoid those root causes from occurring in the future and build a more peaceful society for ourselves and posterity. You have had experience in public life for quite a while, about being uh, a member of the Honorable Liberian Senate today. You were a member of a political party uh, during the crisis through your organization, the Special Emergency Life Program. There were humanitarian intervention into the conflict. And then, of course, uh, in the early 90s, no, prior to the 90s, uh, you had an association with former President Charles Tita working at the GSA, and a lot have come before this commission on what transpired at GSA, how Mr. Taylor left, and all of that. Your experiences along the lines, humanitarian, political, as well as in the legislature today, has uniquely placed you in a position the commission thought is resourceful enough to assist this process and help us to find answers to a lot of questions that library people today do not have answers to. Against that background, we welcome you, sir, and we say thanks very much for coming. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner and honorable members of the TRC. It's my pleasure to have been invited, and um, I'll do the best I can to add my thoughts to this ongoing process. Thank you, sir. I will use this time to introduce Commissioner's present, following which then you will move into your presentation. At the right flank of the panel is Commissioner Sheikh Kafuma Kone. Next to him is Commissioner Umu Sila. Immediately at my left is Commissioner Massa A. Washington. Next to her is Commissioner John Stewart followed by Commissioner Gerald B. Coleman. Of course, I'm Jerome Gradier. You are welcome again, sir. Thank you. Well, Commissioners, let me again say thank you for the invitation. I consider it an honor to have been invited because there are many other Liberians out there who I'm sure have interest in what is happening. So for me to have come and receive an invitation from you is an honor. Uh, indeed, I have been on the road uh, 
uh, in terms of uh, contemporary Liberian history and all of the events that have been taking place. I have been a participant, uh, not necessarily in all of the activities. So I believe I have some contribution to make. Um, what I'd like for you to do for me, in order to put me on the right foot, is to help me establish my status here. Uh, and by that I mean whether I, 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 I first of all, I, I don't see myself as being here in the capacity of a perpetrator. I also uh, do not see myself as being here as a victim. Uh, I do not see myself as a witness to testify for or against someone accused or someone who claim to be a victim. In that instance, I'd like for the commission to help me to, to, to uh, sort of establish my status. How does, how does the commission see me in this process? We think it's a worthy question, and as such, we will see that Based upon your participation during the period of 79 to 2003, the Commission has invited you as a witness, not as, as a victim nor a perpetrator, but as a witness for the Commission, insofar as you will be giving the Commission information on your role your experiences and your perspectives on how we proceed as a nation and people. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I should say that is uh, somewhat uh, reassuring. Um, I did not come with a prepared text. I came psychologically with uh, an attitude, a mindset to, to have a discussion. Uh, I don't think I'm competent to lecture this uh, commission or even to lecture the Liberian people on what has been happening here. And so I'd like to engage myself in a conversation with the commission. Hopefully through the conversation, uh, we will get into some specifics, developments, events, occasions that we could um, exploit. Secondly, basically I am, as a matter of fact, by training, by academic and professional training, I am an analyst. I, um, I did my college work in management systems analysis. And I have a, a taste for analyzing complex issues, trying to find where the system meet and what makes the system to tick. So I enjoy analyzing issues, events, circumstances, with a view of trying to establish the whys. Why did this happen? How did it happen? So I hope that uh, our discussion will um, take that trend and you may find me more uh, productive if we get into analysis of some of the things that happen here. Having said that, let me just say, let me begin by saying that um, for all that I have seen and heard, I want to tell this commission that the Liberian conflict is extremely deep. And as a conflict that is deep, it needs to be properly understood. And um, 
My assessment of the problem indicates that it all started from the from the cotton fields of the United States where white slave masters had two categories of slaves the house slave and the field slave and I, I, I want you to please bear with me let me go through this um, the connection to what happened from 203, I mean from 1979 all the way to 203, I will make that connection. So just bear with me a little while. The house slave and the field slave as the origin of Liberia's problem. My knowledge of the conditions of these two categories of people is that the house slave was favored by the master because that was the slave that worked in the house of the master. That was the slave that uh, prepared the meals and cleaned the master's bedroom, looked after the master's children, attended to the master's guests, and accordingly had to be well mannered had to be schooled in the art of etiquette and protocol. Yes, the house slave was a slave, a black slave, but this black slave had to be cleaned up. And so it was more like a privileged slave compared to the field slave who had to remain outside who had to take care of the fields, take care of the animals, do the farming, clean the yard, more or less the yard boy. The house slave, the field slave, didn't have to go to school much, just learn how to take care of the animals and how best to do the farming, and you'll be a good slave. These two slaves, at some point in time, became a problem for the master. And the master decided that it was time to get rid of them. And what the master did, both of them black, was to grant them freedom. Freedom not to enjoy in the United States, but freedom to be enjoyed in where they came from in this case, Africa. And my little knowledge of history tells me that these two slaves, freed now, were put on a ship called the Elizabeth. I think there must have been 86 of them. And I will make the connection to this story to our me time frame. Let me just uh, establish the premise. Something happened on the Elizabeth. In my mind, that explains the Liberian conflict. On the Elizabeth, the, the deck of the ship had to be washed every two or three days. And of course, with 86 blacks on the ship, the washing of the deck had to be done by these slaves, these ex-slaves. And I believe also on that boat was Jehudi Ashman, the man whose name, who is named after the street outside here, Ashman Street. Jehudi Ashman was white, and he, I think, was the agent of the American Colonization Society. Also, I'm told, was Elijah Iris, also white. Both of them were on this vessel with the 86 immigrants. And the immigrants began fussing among themselves. 
who would watch the ship today or watch the deck initially it was the the few slaves that were on the boat that was expected to do the washing of the deck because normally it's the few slaves that does all the dirty work if you will and then one day one of the few slaves that was expected to do the washing refused to wash on grounds that we are all black and he was making this case to one of the house slaves so you go wash the deck today and confusion broke out but house slaves do not wash decks that's the job for few slaves you know that so they went to the master in this case Juhide Ashman and Eli Iris ran confusion on the boat at the end of hearing both sides An agreement was drawn up outlining how they would conduct themselves. Both of you are free slaves. You must not see yourself as master over the other. And so one day, those of you who are quote unquote free slaves will watch the deck. On Tuesday, those of you who are house slaves will watch the deck. But we cannot make differentiation here. Because both of you are slaves, free. The document that they put together was signed, and that document is called the Elizabeth Pact. My history tells me that the Elizabeth Pact was the first constitution of Liberia, signed by, I believe, almost all the 86 as to how they would relate to one another. And after that, there was calm on the boat. They arrived and they began to interact on shore. The conflict between the house slave, well trained, reasonably educated, well mannered, and the field slave, hard working, not too much interested in all the glamour of position but rather labor the conflict between them is the same conflict today the house slave versus the free slave a government was put together in monrovia at that time they had a colony before they even went into the commonwealth Before we got to know who the citizens were, the government was organized. And so Liberia is a country where the government comes before the people. The government tells the people what to do and not the other way around. And so you see, the Liberian democracy, 161 years old, I believe we are the third oldest democracy in the world, I stand to be corrected. The United States, more than 200 years, uh, somewhere around 230, 231 years of democracy. Haiti, I understand, is the second oldest. The Haitians had a riot and they got rid of their uh, French masters and there where their independence came from. And Liberia, the third oldest democracy in the world. We are older than India. We are older than China. Older than Ghana, Nigeria, Guinea, Sierra Leone, South Africa. On the continent of Africa, we are the oldest democracy. Of course, today when we speak, we say our young democracy, 161 years old, and you still a young democracy. That should tell you something. Anyway, so the government was created before the people, and the people began to look up to the government. But the government that was created 
was a facade. It was not truly a government capable of running a republic. Notwithstanding, it declared itself independent. 1847. And this independent republic was expecting its survival from the United States. Is there any difference today? After 161 years, can the government of Liberia administer the affairs of the state without expecting a survival from the United States? No. Well, when you are independent, when you are sovereign, then you're supposed to control your government. But the people came second. And so today, the entire conflict, in my analysis, that is going on in Liberia is about the people of Liberia trying to take control of the government. And the government refusing to be controlled by the people. That's what the conflict is about. If we, the people of Grand Cru County, for example, or of Cape Mount, or Lofa, are in charge of what is happening in Grand Cru, things will be different. All the anger that we are feeling today is about the Liberian people instructing their government. The people of this country are not interested anymore in being instructed by the government. That's what the fight is about. Turn the thing around, let the people get in charge, government does what the people say, and the confusion is over. And until we do that, this conflict is not going to stop. Well, are we making progress? 205 was a breaking point. Let's mark 205 as the beginning. Everything that happened prior to 205 were preludes. And I want us to use 205 because that was the time when the people of this country honestly looked into the eyes of people who want to go into government. And these people asking the, the citizens for their vote. That was the first time that we've done this in Liberia in a true sense. So 205 is our breaking point and the real pursuit of democracy, the practice of it, should begin from there. So if somebody says, our young democracy, I believe, in the context of this analysis, they'll probably be right. It took 161, uh, 159 years, but I think that we are beginning to now get on track with democracy, government for, by the people, and of the people. We still have hurdles to cross, And I, um, before I close my opening comments, let me just uh, make a small citation here. We are preparing to repeat 205. And I'm referring to the elections, expected election in 211. We should not underestimate the significance of 211. It might even be a more important election than 205. Important in the sense that 211 ought to be the first time when we have organized an election with very little involvement of outsiders. 211, the involvement was extensive. We made an attempt and we did a good job. Uh, 205, I'm sorry, 205, we did a good job. We need to do it in 211. This time, primarily organized and conducted by ourselves. And so 211 become very crucial. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, um, I 
as far as my own personal direct involvement has been, I've been in the business for a little over 35 years. I've been on the road. On the road doing what? On the road trying to make sure that the people of this country take control of the government. I am from Grand Cru, rural Liberia, and I am convinced that we are not anymore going to accept government controlling us. I'm in government now as a senator. I represent the people of Grand Cru County. I know what the people of Grand Cru County want. They have told me, they have mandated me. And I'm trying to implement their will and pleasure. I want to believe that this is the same thing that is happening with all of us who got elected in 2005, including President Sirleaf, to decentralize this government and give the power to the people. I will stop here, and I'm sure our conversation will uh, highlight some other things. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very brief presentation which sought to trace the root causes of our national conflict to the foundation of the Liberian state in which a state in which the government sought to exercise control of our people and the people attempting to control the government and the government resisting control by the people Commissioners will throw to you one or two questions, but uh, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit on how do you perceive a solution to this problem you have just identified. And you intimated that this conflict persists today. We still have it in our governance structure and we are attempting to ensure that the people to a large extent have control over government. Is the solution in decentralization? And if so, how far reaching can decentralized position be in our political context? We do have uh, a republican form of government established by a constitution and we have all supported and upheld the unitary nature of the state. What are your thoughts? Yes, I, I, I want to submit that rapid decentralization and devolution of power should now be our primary agenda. Rapid decentralization and devolution of power should now be the primary objective and perhaps the flagship policy of the government. We have begun to do a number of things, and these things are not well coordinated now. Those of us in government, those of us outside of government, but are nevertheless very much keen on what should happen in terms of the technical procedures to, to achieve rapid decentralization, we ought to take note. Upon the um, induction of the current administration, we attempted to do something. And when I say we, I'm talking about the executive led by President Sirleaf, the legislature. We are collaborating. First of all, we, we, we now know that um, there are indeed three branches of government, equal, counterbalancing each other, but coordinating to keep the country stable. Um, when we pass the budget, somewhere in the budget we put money in there for county development. That is a budget line that was in the first budget we put together. That line is still in there. It started off at $56,000 per, $66,000 per county. It went up to $166,000. Right now, it is at $200,000. The application of this money, accessing this money, is a form of decentralization. The counties do not have a mechanism for coming together and discussing 
how public funds can be prioritized, how they can be applied. That mechanism is now slowly being put into place. Mechanism for decentralization. The issue of decentralization gets much bigger when you start to talk about devolution of power. On the ground, for example, you have what, what we refer to in our tradition as the, as the Council of Chiefs and Elders. This is a traditional structure. In 1946, I believe, when President Tuckman made his first tour, at the end of the tour, David Coleman, who was the Minister of Internal Affairs, prepared a report of the tour. And in that report, it was recommended that the traditional people ought to have their own governance structure. And for the first time, I believe, uh, the central government recognized the Council of Chiefs as a very effective gov governance structure. That the report that was written of Tutman's tour became the interior law. It was later legislated. The entire report, the recommendations, became the interior law. That's what we have today. But something very fundamental, I guess, was overstepped. In that in interior law, it acknowledged that the citizens shall select their own chiefs, that is town, clan, and parliament. But that chief will be answerable to the president. So when uh, Tuckman made this effort to, to acknowledge and maybe to begin decentralization, the central government held on to the powers. Yes, the paramount chief can be selected or elected by his people, but he is amenable to the president. The president can remove the paramount chief or the clan chiefs. Then we introduced the role of commissioners. These commissioners were agents of central government, and their role was to make sure that the rural people were complying with central government edicts. Of course, no need to go into what they did to ensure compliance. In 1984-85, uh, when we had a discussion regarding our current constitution, we again, this time, we elevated the, the, the structure, the local government structure that involved the paramount chief as head of the chiefdom, clan chief, and town chief. And we put that in the constitution that they should be elected. So now we have a constitutional provision that says that these local government people should be elected. But then in that constitution we said that the president may remove these elected officials as a fallacy. We need to find a way to, to make sure that um, the local government officials, especially those that are elected, uh, they not see the president as the source of their power and security as it is now. So if you ask me what are some of the things we need to do in terms of the decentralization, we need to define the mechanisms and put them in place as quickly as possible, especially mechanisms dealing with local government. The role of the superintendent is to enforce the mandate of the president, period. Of course, the mandate of the president is the government programs. In trying to enforce government programs, what is the relationship between paramount chief, who is the elected official of the chiefdom, the real elected official of the chiefdom on the ground, and the superintendent? Uh, we need to work on this and define it in a way that the superintendent does not supersede the paramount chief. But as, as, as it is now in rural Liberia, the superintendent sends for the paramount chiefs. It should not be. The, the superintendent represents the president as agent of the president. You cannot have the agent of the president going into the county headquarter and then sending for paramount chiefs. Occasionally, yes, but as a routine, it should not be. It's one of those things that I believe is responsible for our conflict. So the people at the bottom have no capacity whatsoever. They have no power. Is power inherent in the people? The Constitution says so. The reality is 
No. All the power is here in the office of the president. We need to reverse that. Thank you. In 1979, there was a civil disturbance in Liberia, which many have seen as the beginning of violence in our modern politics. Uh, how did this conflict manifest itself during the April 1979 race riots? What was your role at the time? And eventually there was a military coup during the period 80 to 85. What were your experiences that you think uh, the Liberian people in this commission could benefit from? First of all, I was not in the country when this incident occurred. But um, I was very much in tune with what was happening in Liberia. As a young student in the United States going to school, uh, we had begun the activists, we were the, the activists uh, generation agitating for change, uh, agitating for decentralization of government. But I was not in the country, but nevertheless, what happened in 79, this particular incident you just mentioned, historians have described it as the rice riot. I think they are describing it wrong. I think we should call it a rice massacre. Is there a difference? To call it rice riot, you are blaming the people that got shot on ground that they were rioting. If you call it a rice massacre, in my view, you put the blame squarely on the government because it was the government that shot and people died. People did not die because they were, quote unquote, rioting. People died because the government shot. And I think history needs to put this right. Now, that event, of course, was a turning point because for the first time, citizens of Liberia decided to, to speak out on an issue publicly and to instruct government that we don't want the price of rice to be increased. How did that turn into bloodbath? This is something that we need to understand. If people decide that we want to instruct our government, this particular policy should not be. How come it turned into a bloodbath? It turned into a bloodbath because they, it goes back again. The government could not tolerate the people instructing it. Well, the government has to be instructed. It's in our constitution. The people have a right to assemble at any time, whether it's midnight, whether it's in the morning, whether it's in the evening, without threat to anyone, to assemble at any time and consult upon the common good. That's what we have in our constitution. So when the people consult on the common good, the constitution say they should instruct their representatives. It didn't say they should appeal to their representative. When the people have consulted and they feel strong about an issue, they should give instructions, not appeals. Instruct the government. Well, the government of Liberia cannot be instructed. The government instructs the people. We need to reverse this. Democracy is upside down in Liberia. We can't even have a chieftain's election. It is not possible to conduct local elections in Liberia. It's not possible Un unless we restructure the ground. But the ground that the government of Liberia has been using all through the generations, 161 years, that ground, that structure, is not possible to conduct an election. So how is it that, uh, uh, that the government of Liberia will just go on running the country without election at the bottom. We got elected in 205. We should have done local election before the national election in 205, but it was not possible, so I participated in a workshop conducted by the NEC, and we made a case that let us have the local elections first. You don't start building a house from the top. And all the partners, the international people, the election commission, the political parties, we all agreed 
and that was the way to go. When the, 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 the facilitators went on the ground, they started asking critical questions. How many children do you have? Nobody knew. How many cities you have? Nobody knew. Towns, clans. See, so what do you call clans? Nobody really knows what's a clan. As we speak now in Liberia, nobody knows what's a chiefdom. How come? Nobody knows what's a clan or what's a town. We need to define these things. The other day we had a problem and uh, we went to the Supreme Court for city mayor. The president wants to appoint city mayor. Ah, no, you cannot appoint city mayor, Madam President. These are elected positions. We end up in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court wanted to know what's a city. We didn't have a definition. They reverted to the Blackwell Dictionary, which is the Dictionary of Lawyers. And that dictionary said that a city is a political subdivision. What does the Constitution say? The president shall appoint superintendents and other leaders of political subdivision. Is a city a political subdivision? Yes. Well, then the president will appoint. That was the ruling. But the president knows nowhere in the world are city mayors appointed. So the president is a little hesitant now. Even though the Constitution has given the president the, the right to go appoint city mayors. She can't. They will look ugly. City mayors appointed, city councils appointed. And what happened to the citizens? Democracy is upside down in this country. So, I hope I've, I've, I'm, I'm answering your, your concerns here. Let us democratize the bottom as quickly as possible. And we can begin now. We started doing some things already. We will make mistakes along the way, but I'm sure in the next four or five years, it will get straight. If we're not careful, we may not even conduct the election in 2011. And then back to square one. So the emphasis of my, of my thoughts here, the Liberian conflict, is all the government. The government here is too centralized. As long as this government remains as centralized as it is, we're not going to have peace. The reason why there are no uh, uh, schools, for example, in, in Grand Cru County, is because the government is too centralized. I went home, I'm campaigning. And I asked a group of chiefs, women, and they were complaining that they didn't have a school in this particular town. And I said, but do you all want a college in Grand Cru? So yeah. Have you decided you want a college? He said, no. <laughs> and you're not going to have it. See? The people of this country need to take charge. Everything government. Everything government. Of course, everything should be... The government should provide the leadership, yes. But who's going to put the school in picnicers? Are you telling me, I'm from picnicers, Grand Crew. Are you telling me that we are supposed to wait for somebody in Monrovia, for the Minister of Education, before we can have a school in Grand Crew? No, it should not be. So the people in rural Liberia are waiting for the government, as the government of 1847 was waiting for a supply from ACS. And the government of Liberia today is still waiting for its supply from America. When do we take charge of this country? That's what the conflict is about. When do we take charge? We're slaughtering one another. I was here in Monrovia during the war. And I was standing in the room and I saw, I was looking through the window, spying through the window, I saw some fighters. And they had this man, uh, double tying him. And they were headed for the beach behind where the old Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs is now. I was looking through the window. And they were carrying this man. Who's carrying him? Liberians. Where are they carrying him? They're going to kill him. Good grief. What is this fight about? What is this fight about? It's about making the government of Liberia responsible to the people. The man come, he said, we'll come to remove some of your dough. And he starts shooting from Butuo. What a poor man in Butuo got to do with somebody in Moravia? He starts shooting from Butuo. The other man came, he going to move, remove charge Taylor. He starts shooting from Foya. 
What's going on here? So you want to remove the president? What are you shooting me for? Is it what you are a friend of the president? Alright. You want to remove government? Why don't you have an election? That's how people do it. That's what they told us in Accra. When I asked me, he said, Mr. Nelson, what are you people fighting for in Liberia? I said, we're trying to straighten up the country. That's what you're trying to do? Yes. But that's not how people straighten up the country, Mr. Nelson. So I said, how do we do it? So you have an election. So we agreed to have an election. Because the international group were telling us, if you guys want to fix your country, you're not going to do it by guns. That's not how it, that's not how it works. So we agreed, okay, we'll do an election. And the election, everybody should take part. Once you meet the, the basic criteria, take part. Don't ban people. Don't ban people. The government of Liberia in, in, in 1985, banning people from, from running. Why you want to ban somebody? You know the consequence of banning someone from exercising his rights? It's bloodshed. And the government is in the habit of banning people. We got another one developing now. We have enacted a law on corruption. Everybody is corrupt. No, everybody is not corrupt. But what do you mean by corruption in the first place? 1980, they charged the people with rampant corruption. Rampant corruption. What is corruption? So we have provided a definition now. So nobody should be jumping around here anymore accusing this one of corruption, accusing that one of corruption. Don't do that anymore because we have a law now. We're trying to, that, that's, that's what we're trying to do now. There's a law on corruption. The president should not be jumping up and accusing this one of corruption and firing this one for corruption. The president should not do that. If anybody in government or outside of government is perceived is suspected of corruption, send the person to the corruption commission, not to the Ministry of Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Pana. Thank you very much. Uh, Nelson, for appearing before the TRC and expressing your views and perception, even before the formation of Liberia as a nation state. In your opening statement, you agree that you were a participant or you are a participant but not a victim now a perpetrator. If you are asked to rightly place yourself to, to rightly place yourself in the contemporary happenings of Liberia since 35 years ago, where would you place yourself? Today, I will place myself as a decision maker, a national decision maker today. Yesterday, or day before yesterday, I was an activist. I protested against what I thought was wrong. Then I became an advocate, and there's a difference in my mind. Now, I do not consider myself today as an activist, but I'm not protesting anymore. I used to be an advocate. I've gone above that now. I'm a decision maker now. So I'll place myself in the category of a national decision maker today. As analyst, if you were to ask to wait happenings in Liberia since the 70s, 
What would you say? To to wait. Wait. To wait. Yeah. To wait the at the happenings. Yeah. Which one had the greatest weight? Yeah. Each time you believe you have one that is heavier than the other, the consequence of that heavier one becomes even more heavy. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Uh, the, the one single event that we say is more heavier than the other, uh, to be honest with you, it will be difficult. The civil war, the, the fighting itself, is a serious matter. Death, destruction, the coup, which was an event, a trigger, was also a serious matter. To jump up in the executive mansion and shoot the president and take on the powers of head of state, that is a serious matter. Maybe we can backtrack all the way to a simple little incident that we can call the trigger. What triggered all of this? Could it be the rice massacre? It's not as, as, as enormous as, for example, the April 12. Is April 12 much bigger than the Civil War? It's difficult for me to, 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 to weigh these things. You know, it's very difficult. Because like I said, each action, each event triggers a series. Even the conversation we're having today may very well be the beginning of something much bigger than we can imagine. But we have had some very large events here. Some are small. The election of 205. So to be honest with you, it's a little difficult for me to put weight on these things. I think they all have the same weight in their own rights. As an activist and an advocate, now as national decision maker, what experience have you gathered from the past as compared to the position you now occupy as decision maker, national decision maker. Let us calm down. Calm down. The things that are making us angry are grave. They're very large. But I, I would say to all of us Liberians, calm down. Calm down. You haven't seen anything yet in terms of the things that are provocative. You haven't seen anything yet. And we have to be strong enough to see the hideousness of some of the things that, are, that have happened and even some of the things that are happening today and, and, and be calm to be able to deal with them. If we were to get angry, we would not get anywhere. And for me, this is why I thought that the TRC would have given us that platform to help us calm down, notwithstanding all of the vicissitudes of life that we are faced with today. So, as a national decision maker, and somebody will say, well, you are saying calm down now because you're in government. When you were out of government, you were not calming down. That is true. That is very true. When I was out of government, I could not calm down. And I'm sure the voices of calm were there. But I could not listen. Today I'm in government and I'm telling the rest of society, calm down so that we can be able to solve this problem. One should not say because I didn't calm down yesterday, so therefore we are not going to calm down today. One should not say that. So I think that it's incumbent upon me as a national leader not to ring this bell so loud that people get angry with me. The bell has to be soft enough because my intention it's not to make people angry. People will criticize me, will say all sorts of things against me. I must be strong enough to be calm in spite of the storm. Yesterday, the government people were not calm. You criticize government, a treason. 
I mean, if you know what the government did to some of the people they accused of treason, that was my government calming people down. The things we have to do to strengthen our country are very, very large. We talk about devolution of power, to, to divorce power from the center, to the fringes. You need calm. <laughs> you cannot do it with everybody yelling and everybody screaming. You have to learn. We have to create mechanism like this so that we may consult on the common good in an orderly and peaceable manner. Key words. Consult on the common good in an orderly and peaceable manner. The government has to set up the framework for people to consult. And the consultation, once you get in that consultation room, the, the rule is don't throw blows. You want to scream, you want to yell, you want to lie down, you want to wallow, please do that. Get it out of your system, but in, in, in a way that would not harm the next man. So I think that as, as a national decision maker, whatever we will be faced with now, let's do it in a spirit of calm and we will get somewhere. Whether it's in the legislature or whether it's in the judiciary or in the executive, the, the, the boss word is to be calm and you weather the storm. Since uh, you claim that one of the strives in Liberia is for the people to take over the government so as it to become a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. What effort the legislature is making to bring this idea into light and how do you think that the Liberian peoples will go about taking over the control of the government as their things? Well, in, in terms of what the legislature is doing, there are a couple of things that I can cite now, whether they qualify as being sufficient to achieve the objective is subject to debate. When, for example, the, first of all, the legislature has a statutory function. In performing those statutory functions, that way we have to exhibit this thing that I, that I refer to as a, a withering of the storm with a spirit of calm. When the president makes a nomination, it is our duty to vet that nominee. The way we do it can indeed have an impact on calming the country down. And the nominees themselves, when they come, they come honestly to present themselves to be scrutinized. Now, when a nominee comes to the legislature to be scrutinized, we should not make this nominee uncomfortable. The environment should be very relaxed, should be very honorable, should be very professional. So even if the person does, does not get confirmed because the variables didn't add up, the person doesn't walk away feeling bad. So we in the legislature, we have a duty as well to create an environment for calm. And we have tools available to us. They may not be perfect tools now in terms of how we manage them. For example, the question of our plenary, plenary sessions. That's the forum for debate. Those plenary sessions ought to be a forum where citizens can come and listen to Senator Nelson debating an issue. All right, it's not a place where you don't, you don't go there to show how much book you know, it's how much, how much you understand the issue. Um, when the president sends a budget, can we debate the budget in an open environment and let the citizens know that we are raising critical questions. That's the oversight function of government, of the, of the legislature. Then, of course, every year we have uh, two breaks. We have a short break around Easter time. What do we do with that short break? You go back to your constituency and you meet with some, some opinion leaders. The big break, which is what we call the agricultural break, is not really agriculture, but that's the name that it was given in the, in the law. During this time, can I go now and report to my people? Can I go and consult with them? 
Is the mechanism there for consultation? As we speak now, no. There are no structure mechanism in Liberia for consultation for lawmakers to go back to their people. So if I went home now, I would have to organize meetings. And sometimes in organizing the meetings, I have to spend money. I have to provide the resources. Can the state provide the resources for consultation? Never mind the result of the consultation, but the structure. So we talk about the Council of Chiefs, for example. Where is the Council of Chiefs? I'd like to go back to, I'm, I'm sure my colleagues would like to do that. Go back and report to the Paramount Chief and the Council. They elected me. So those kinds of things are things that we can begin to do, and we are trying to do them in the legislature to allow for consultation. You said it happened on April 14, 1979. Should not be seen as riot, but as massacre. Can you tell us how did you see the April 14 episode? The the happening of April 14, 1979. Is it a beginning of democratic process or was it an opening of a Pandora box for violence? It was not an opening of a Pandora box for violence. It was unfortunate that uh, certain events occurred uh, violently occurred. It was, it was unfortunate. But the intent of that process of people protesting was an exercise in democracy. Of course, the government was frightened by it. The government was under tremendous pressure at the time. So an event such as people organizing themselves to march or demonstrate with black cars and calling on government, we say no, we say no down with government, down with the policy, all these kinds of things. It was frightening to the government that had never seen such a thing before. And the government reaction was to, was, to, was to refuse to allow it to happen. That refusal is what brought the problem. Even today, there are people that want to demonstrate. What is wrong with demonstration? Isn't demonstration a part of freedom of expression? Can we in Liberia today manage thousands and thousands of people demonstrating without, without uh, uh, suggesting that they're coming to burn things down? And vice versa. Those people who wish to demonstrate is the right to demonstrate. But don't throw stone when you're demonstrating. That is not demonstration. Throwing stone is not part of demonstration. It's not part of uh, when they say you have a right to express your view. So, for me, um, those are some of the things that we need to do here. The people want to demonstrate to oppose the increase in the price of rice. Give them the protection they need. Let them demonstrate. Open up the field. You know, Sheikh, this government is not correct. The Liberian government is not correct. They're not correct. But it's getting correct now. After the Civil War, after 205, the government is getting correct now, and I'm sure we'll, we'll make progress. There was a time in this country when, when you say that, I, you know, I'm thinking about running for presidency. That's sedition. People die in jail because they, they just thought about it. There was a time when, if you, were, if you were against some kind of government policy, you would not be allowed to go nowhere near City Hall. And we had to have... A uh, 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 public meeting on the beaches. Do you know what it means when thousands of people are forced to go on the beach and have a meeting? They're taking their problem to God. And apparently, the governor of the day did not see what was happening. When people are compelled, this is a hell of a big hall. What's wrong with the hall? People sitting down. We requested to use city hall, and they said, "No, you cannot use city hall because you're anti-government." Okay, so we went to the beach. God would not tell us, don't have your meeting on the beach. And by having a meeting on the beach when the city hall was empty was a source for problem. People just got angrier and angrier. 
And so, the, the right massacre, it was the government's fault. Even today, people want to protest against the rights issue. Can this government tell them, no, don't protest? No, you can't do that. They want to protest, you ask for the route, which route you want to use, because that is the Ghana. So we want to march from Centennial Pavilion and pass this way, pass this way, you guide them. And then they go and make all their speeches. At the end of the speeches, then it's not enough to say, okay, you can march and you can protest and then you go home. It's not enough. The people are trying to influence government. Government needs to listen. They, because there are many ways that people can bring pressure on government. Of course, violence is not an acceptable method. Never is violence acceptable. There's a bunch of ladies that sit at the airport every time something begins to happen. I think they call them the wheeling mothers. And they just go and sit at the foot of the airport. They just sit there. And you think we're not noticing that? Those of us in government. When those ladies get to that place and they are sitting down, they're not bothering anybody. They just sit in the sun all day. And I go past them. My conscience beats me every day. What are they protesting for now? Let's respond so that these women can go home. I saw a protest here. It was not a protest, actually, it was a march when Mr. Taylor was here. The women marched to the Capitol building with a bill. I think they got it an inheritance bill or something. It was raining that day. And I was, uh, then I was in the mansion. I looked out the window, and these women, there must have been two or three thousand of them, marching in the rain, trying to express their view. And they got to the Capitol building and presented their petition that they wanted this inheritance bill. And I remember very well, the speaker then, my friend, uh, Robert Makomna, told them that the bill would not be passed. <laughs> See, looking at women of this country in their thousands asking for a bill, you the speaker, you say the bill will not be passed. Who are you? So they left me alone. Need I tell you how Honorable Speaker McCormick got out of power? And on the eve of leaving power, October 14, that morning, that when the Liberian legislature passed the bill that the women were talking about, it was too late. And so we in government must, must understand when people are protesting, you must understand what they are saying. The man tells me, you say, if, no, I ask the man a question, how do I know what God wants me to do? <laughs> he said, my son, listen to the laughter of the rich. And listen to the cry of the poor and you will know what God wants you to do listen to the laughter of the rich and listen to the cry of the poor and you will know what God wants you to do are you listening to the book yes sir I'm trying to uh, I'm not sure if my ears are clear enough. I'm trying to. And every day I pray that God will, will help me to hear these cries and the laughter. Because I truly want to know the difference. There's, there's a cry in the library community. <coughs> Sir? There is a cry. There is a cry in the library community. And this cry contains that our 1847 constitution as well as 1986 constitution are, were unanimous crystal and clear that all persons born in Liberia are equal before the law and that Liberia is a pluralistic society. 
and the population is composed 70% of the indigenous Algerians, 20% of Muslims and 15% of Christians. Yet, one group of the three are contending that Liberia is a Christian nation and was founded on Christian principles. And government of the past as well as the present try to give credence to this by forcing people not to do business on Sunday. Whenever a holiday falls on Sunday, it will be observed on the following Monday, thereby giving credence to that contention that Liberia was founded on Christian principle and therefore a Christian nation. What you as the legislature since you are charged with the responsibility of promulgating law that will give more strength to our constitution and take into consideration of Article 14 of the Liberian Constitution. What you are doing personally as an advocate, as activist, as av advocate, now as national decision maker to correct this situation where every Liberian will feel themselves a true citizens of this country, equally treated, equally recognized, with no preferential treatment or regard for any group of people. I think, uh, Sheikh, you, you are referring to an issue that needs to be addressed by this country. I don't think it's a, it's a simple issue, but it has to get addressed. Uh, as I think through it, a number of questions come to mind. As I said earlier, I spent a lot of time analyzing issues because I'm trained, that's how I was trained. So many times, any issue that, that I'm confronted with, I try to do some analysis and all of that, and it helps me a lot. The analysis is not always right, I mean, I must admit, but it helps me a lot to get my bearing. Is there a law in Liberia that says that Sunday is a holiday? Um, again, that's a question. Or is there a law that says that uh, Christmas is a holiday? Yes. Or is it just a practice? No, there's a law. If there is a law, a statute, that says that Sunday is a holiday and therefore no one, no office should be open, then there has to be a law that, that would respect the Muslim or the, the other faiths. If there is a law that respects one faith, then there must be a law that respects the other faith. That, that's my position. If there is no law, do you want to create a law that will respect a faith? I remember there was a situation here with, um, some time back, a late judge found. There was a case that the government had interest in, and this case was scheduled by Judge Fan on, on Friday. Good Friday. Yeah, that particular Friday happened to be quote unquote Good Friday. And Judge Fan, somebody brought it to his attention. Now Good Friday is not a holiday, it's a, it's a, a day for the Christians. And Judge, I think it was, uh, anyway, somebody brought it to his attention. But his decision was, I'm not here for Good Friday business. The court is open on Good Friday. Good Friday for Christians, it's, it's not for everybody. That was how the judge handled it that day. I thought it was interesting. In the Liberian legislature today, we have a chaplain. The chaplain we have is a Christian. And every time we open a session, the chaplain has to pray. And he reads the Bible. What about the Muslims that are among us? 
So that's a good question. And the nation ought to face this issue. I understand today, there are, I think there's an interfaith group that is trying to evolve some idea on the same matter. In the United States, you don't pray in, in, in the U.S. Congress. You can say a silent prayer. But in the United States, again, I believe there are no Sundays, not a public holiday. But how come government offices are closed on Sunday? Even in the United States. In Liberia, government offices are closed on Sunday. Who says that government offices should be closed on Sunday? Is there a law that says that? Or is it just a practice? So these are issues that we will have to deal with. To deal with this kind of issue, you don't need a centralized government. You don't need a centralized government. These shops, stores are open here in Morovia now. On Sundays I go driving down Red Lion and I see people so, look how we get in there. But again, the, the, the country cannot be a country of atheists. We must be, we must respect the Creator. How we respect the Creator, our Constitution says we should not differentiate. And how we live through that is something that uh, is a challenge for us. So, the issue you are raising, I think, is an important issue and need to be addressed by the country. That much I can say now. Thank you. You said that 2011 should not be underestimated. Can the, you elaborate? 2011 is the, is the real test case as to whether we are capable of conducting a free, fair, transparent election in Liberia. And I should say this. Our Elections Commission has been doing some practices with these by-elections, even though we do not pray for by-elections. The by-elections mean, most of the, at least the one we have had is not because someone has resigned, it's because unfortunately we have had that in the legislature. But nevertheless, they provided us some opportunities for, for Liberians to practice how to engage one another. Um, how does the, the government, the ruling party, behave in the by-electoral process? Um, 2011 will be the big one. How will the ruling party conduct itself when it's going to be challenged by many other parties? So 2011 becomes a, a serious case. The, the international community, by the time we get to 2011, we should be in the position to ask our international partners, can you step a little bit back? Don't go away, don't, don't leave us alone, but just, just move a few more steps back and let's see if we can conduct this thing and at the end of it, we celebrate. That's what I meant by 2011, it's critical. Um, and we should, we should do everything possible to... Listening to what you have said and taking into consideration that NEC attempted to put the machinery of that test for 2011 into operation, thereby submitting bills to the legislature for consideration. And the legislature did not. How will you look at this statement of not underestimating 2011 and the action of the legislature in failing to pass those bills when there is a provision in the Constitution that any provision within the Constitution that have to be amended must go for referendum and one year before that amended uh, document is put into consideration. What will you say when they say, well, but you have derelicted your duty as legislature in aborting that attempt to test or to put machinery into place that will not in any way hinder or hamper 2011 election. What will you say? Um, it is unfortunate that the national legislature failed to, to act on these electoral bills. It's, it's very unfortunate. Again, it's one of those things. The, the lawmakers and I'm one of them, we need pressure.
pressure. We need, and I'm not using the word pressure in a negative sense. We need to be, we need to become conscious that when the interest of a citizen is at stake, it takes priority. The citizens who have the interest in this matter, where are they? Where are they? Don't leave us alone in that building to do our own thing. Because if you do that, when I say you, I'm talking about the Liberian populace. Don't look at it as, and again it goes back to my original point, the government people. There's no such thing as government people here. Political parties, civil society, interest group, pressure group, where are they? Now, if you want to get very specific, but Senator Nelson, what position did you take on these matters? I'm in the clear. I'm speaking for me now. I'm in the clear because on the floor of the Senate, I argue and argue and argue, and I must say that I was not alone. There were others. At the end of the day, the majority say we're not ready. The majority say we're not ready. <laughs> majority that majority need to understand that the bigger majority is the Liberian people whatever that majority is in that legislature and the bigger majority need to wake up and smell the coffee so that a little majority does not lead it down the tube so those of us from political parties from our constituencies if I went back to Grand Cru today my constituency ought to hold me accountable why didn't you guys pass these bills? Well, where is the mechanism for my constituency to actually discuss with me now? Which of the organizations in this city, Morovia, has called me to ask me, Senator Nelson, what happened to the bill? Not one. Not one. And so the few that believe that it is a tune, it just out there by itself, and the larger society is having a feast, mocking it, and laughing at it. It's not going to carry anywhere. We need to be held accountable. We need to be called to the, to, the, to the platform. Where did you stand? We have a situation there. Nobody knows how I'm voting on issues. But that is a government that is not interested in the individual position. It's always shrouded in the collective all in favor say yeah, all against say nay, and you don't know who say yeah, who say nay. We need to differentiate. Everybody is not corrupt. So we should not say they are corrupt. Who need they? People should stop saying the government is corrupt. So we got a, we got a corruption commission now to find out who in the government is corrupt. The same thing with the legislature. How am I voting on these important issues? I would have loved today to come here and say, we took a vote on this matter and go to the record. Don't let me tell you, go to the record. I would have loved to do that, but we don't have such a thing. So you will not know how I'm voting. To know how I'm voting, you got to demand it. Demand it of the legislature. We want to see your voting record. Uh, a, few, a, a few months ago, there was a thing started by the JPC here to put up, um, what do you call it, a, a report or something, report card. And they started publishing these things, who is attending session and all of that. Very good attempt. Except that they politicize it by, by not going beyond that. If I were not in session on a day, and yes, I was absent for that session, you gotta go beyond. If I were absent, where was I? If you didn't take that into account, I could have been on an assignment, I could have been in my constituency, and that need to be said. So that particular method was a little bit problematic. It need to be cleaned up so that the report card can come out. The, the citizens of this country need to get hold of our voting record in the house. And we are making some very, very important decisions that affect your lives. And you don't know how I'm voting? So you package everybody. They, they, they are all confused. They are all causing trouble. Who need they? I don't want to be a part of confused people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
appearing at the first half of our hearings today. We'd like to take a break, but for to your indulgence, and return at 2 p.m. To continue at 2 p.m. today. Yeah, I'll be here. Okay, sir. Bless Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Harry of